Okay, folks, today we're going to look at forecasting when we have non-stationary data. That is data that is affected by some other process or does not simply happen by random chance. So what we're testing for is the presence. Uh, before we can begin that process, we need to test for the presence of what's called a unit root. So I'll come over and I'll define what that is and then I'll explain it. We test for a unit root. We're looking for a process that makes it different. Uh, so the unit root is a stochastic trend or some sort of up and down trend that prevents it from just being a random walk. What we mean by random walk is it's just randomness. So it's randomness with a drift, if you will, right? So if you have a unit root, you'll find some sort of systemic or systematic pattern that is unpredictable. When it isn't there, you can see a, uh, excuse me, when it is there, you can see some sort of upward or cyclical trend, or maybe it's a downward, but cyclical trend. And so it indicates that the data are moving. What we have to do is rule that out to determine whether we're going to be able to use our solid understanding of the concepts that we've already learned, or we're going to have to come up with some other way to deal with this. So let me explain it a little better. Suppose um, you are walking down the sidewalk and you're on your phone texting. If you are not paying attention, you're walking down the sidewalk, pretty soon you find yourself drifting from one side to the other. And if you're making a sort leftward drift, then you're going to soon find yourself in the grass in the yard somewhere or on the sidewalk or off the sidewalk or whatever. Or you're driving your car and something catches your eye and you look to the right and automatically your brain drives the car to the right. If you are not doing that, you become, even though it's random, you have a stationary process. That is, you're able to keep the car between the lines, so to speak. And as you're able to keep the car between the lines, it makes it much, much easier for you to not have that drift. And so you're able to keep the car moving down the road, even though you have a slight variation. And so what we look for is the presence of what's called a unit root. Here we see interest rates as they are um, in the, as the Fed had predicted them and how we were able to drop them. So around 1968, there was a supply shock and we went into a mild recession. If there had not been the recession or if there had not been some sort of presence of that, uh, the numbers would have simply followed this nice random pattern. So without that shock, we would have been able to simply weather it out and about 1970 things would have flowed on out. But it was about that time that we actually also got off the gold standard. And so because we systematically got off the gold standard and went into a recession, we were able to, uh, the Fed was able to start manipulating the, um, the money supply. And as a result, they continue to inject money into the process. And so you can see that our numbers went down in a cyclical pattern. So there's a downward trend with a cyclical pattern here, right? Here, there's simply the cyclical pattern with no trend. So what we want to find out when doing our test, is there a trend or is it just a cyclical pattern? And if the trend is there, then that means we have a non-stationary process, which means we have to adjust the way we evaluate the numbers. So let's look at a scenario. You've been hired as a, a newly hired general manager for a mid-sized ski resort in Aspen. And Aspen, of course, is uh, very busy during the winter with skiing and so on and so forth. So you notice that your predecessors kept really good data. And so what you want to do is look at the occupancy rates and you want to decide whether or not those occupancy rates follow some sort of trend or if they've been increasing over time. Now, you know the data are seasonal. You know that they're going to go up in a pattern up in the winter, down in the summer. But you don't know if they're stationary. And what I mean is you don't know if they're increasing or decreasing. So you know 
They're up in the winter down in the summer, but have they been going up from say 2012 to 2013 to 2014 all the way across? And if so, where will you be in the next few months? Okay. So to test that, we have to test for the presence of, um, we're gonna use the Dickey Fuller test to test for the presence of the unit root, all right? And I explained this part to you, so I'll let you read that on your own. But basically what we're looking is for a non-stationary process. So with that in mind, we're gonna take our hypothesis here and we're going to look at the hypothesis that the data are not stationary versus the hypothesis that the data are stationary. This is simple randomness simple randomness versus not random. And so we're going to look at the lags between each of the data points and see how they fit. So at the bottom here, we have our data and we have time period T all the way from one to 24. Now, because this particular resort books two months in advance, we're going to look at each of the data elements and the observations and two months intervals. So May of 2016 is actually April and May. July of 2016 is actually June and July. And this is be August and September, so on and so forth. So even though there are 24 periods, we actually have four years worth of data. So with that in mind, let's talk about how we're going to actually calculate each of these pieces. For the occupancy lag, you simply lag it back two periods. So we're gonna take the occupancy for May of 16 and we're gonna forward it two periods. So what we wanna find out here is, do we have the presence of some sort of serial autocorrelation, which would then mean that the data are not stationary? And when I mean serial autocorrelation, it just means that they are correlated together in a time series. So we take this occupancy rate and we pull it here to the occupancy lag, right? And so the way we do that is we simply say equals pick 1352. So in cell H23, we'll say that it equals F21. And then we autofill from there, okay? Simply double click and it will autofill all the way to the bottom. For the month lag, we're looking at, okay, how does each one of these lag? So this is just gonna be a one period lag. So this is just gonna equal to the number for July minus the number for May. And you should get 61. Now the reason I got 61, if you don't have that, go up to the numbers, make sure that instead of a date format, instead of date format, that it is a number format. Instead of date format or general, we'll pick number, and then that should give you 61. Because from the beginning of May to the end of July is 61 days. And then you autofill all the way down with that one as well. So when you're done, you should have these numbers. Now, what we're going to do is we're gonna look at what is the actual number versus these two lags. So our occupancy rate is going to be a Y, the month lag and the occupancy lag are going to be X variables. In that regard, we're gonna end up with a regression analysis. Now to keep my life simple, I know that I'm gonna start here. So I'm gonna take these two boxes and I'm going to color them in dark blue as well. And that makes it easier for me to figure out, okay, I'm gonna start here instead of there. Alternatively, the best thing to do is take this and copy it and put it here on top of my data. This then tells me we're gonna start a new process. If you wanna keep the original data, then we can copy it over, copy over the header, Scroll down to the bottom. And then we can copy, starting with the third period, all of my data. 
come here we're going to right click paste special put in just the values if you had put in the formulas or if you just copy and paste then it's going to give you funkiness so make sure that you paste just the values so now we have our y variable we have the month lag and we have the occupancy lag and now we can do a regression analysis we're going to go to data data analysis regression and my y range will be the occupancy lag we're going to start with cell k23 and go to k45 but it doesn't matter there we just want to make sure we get the y variable my X range is going to be here. Check the box that says labels. Check confidence level at 95%. That means that alpha is going to be 0 0.05. And my output range will be here. All right, so I'll put it in P27. Again, these numbers are up to you. Where you get your, where you output your range to is up to you. It's wherever you have room. And for the Y range, it's again the occupancy rate. The X range is the month lag and the occupancy lag. We click OK. Right. And here's what we get. Now, the very first thing I notice is that neither of the P values make these significant. In other words, we know that the P values do not have an effect on the occupancy. The lagging indicators do not have an effect on occupancy. In other words, what we did the previous month does not have an effect on what we're doing in this period. What we did the month before that does not have an effect on this period. But we still need to test using the tau indicator and that's where the t-stat comes in. Now we're going to come here and we're going to look at these t-stats and we're going to compare them to the known T, right? So the table I've given you here allows you to compare those two T stats. This is for the month lag. This is for the occupancy lag. And so now we're going to look at these two T stats using this model. If the calculated T, what we have here, is less than the critical T, then we have a significant result. The calculated T less than the critical T, we have a significant result. Now, one thing I want to add to this is that we're going to look at the, at the absolute value. Okay. So if the absolute value of the calculated T is less than the absolute value of the critical T, so we take this and we have 1.7759 and we're going to compare that to n equals 25 because the closest we have is 24. We want to be 95% confident so we're going to look here. All right. And let me just draw a heavy box around that. So we're going to look at this particular T stat. The absolute value of the month lag is not an indicator because the absolute value here is less than the absolute value for, um, excuse me, the absolute value for the month lag is less than the, the critical number here. So we calculated the 1.77. The critical is 1.95. This number is less than that. And therefore, we have a significant result there. All right. But for the occupancy, we do not. This number absolute is larger than this number. And as a result, we don't have the unit root present. Now, let me help you further interpret that. OK, we're going to reject the null hypothesis for the second one and fail to reject for the first one. So what that means is that the month is stationary. 
this is where you get that cyclical pattern, okay? The month is stationary. So the ebb and flow of the month period is going to be much uh, greater. It's going to stay stationary. In other words, as you move through your process, the stationarity of it is going to be the same. But when you look at your occupancy rates, the occupancy rates are non-stationary. That is, they have an ebb and flow to them. So this indicates to me, and we're going to do further testing on the seasonal data in the next video, but this indicates to me that you actually have the cyclical pattern that you were looking for, and there's some sort of overall trend to your occupancy. We don't know if it's going up or down yet, and we will find that out in the next video. I hope this helps, and have a great day.